Now, the message of this hour, the title, as you see it in your, in your bulletin there, is titled, Tears and the Church. Now, this is in the Bible. So it'll do us good to take heed and understand and learn what Christ aimed to teach us in this subject, tares in the church. Now, let none go about judging, accusing church members. Don't do that. That's for Christ. You know, Jesus says, Matthew 12, 30, he says, Jesus says that it's not, who is not with me is against me, and he that gathers not with me scattereth abroad. That's what the master say. The time of the harvest will fully determine the character of the two classes, tares and wheat. At the time of the harvest. In the church, the work of separation is given to the angels of God, not to the hands of man. Matthew 24, 31. Now, the text that was just read to us, the Bible says, well, you heard it. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. I don't think like you. I don't do things the way you would do them. That's what the text is saying. You know, do you ever wonder why God do certain things in the way he does? Why, you know, why doesn't he do certain things the way you thought he would have done it? Well, he tells us. He don't think like we think. He don't do things like we do them. I'm sure we all in our lives, when we live long enough, have experienced things in our, in our lives that we were sure what ought to happen. We were absolutely sure on what, on what should have happened. But later on, we changed our mind. Have you ever done that? Not God. He don't have to change his mind. Because he is God. He does not make mistakes like we do. You recall there in the books of Acts chapter 9, Ananias said, Lord, do you know who this man is? I'm paraphrasing. Speaking of Saul, Paul. This man, Lord, he have caused harm and killed your saints. Speaking of Paul, Saul. Now, God told Ananias, go thy way. He is a chosen vessel unto me. Had that been one of us, we probably would try to kill him the first chance we got or be glad to see him killed. But God don't work that way. Because of this, we have most of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. The man who was having Christians killed. But God said, Ananias, go thy way. He's a chosen vessel unto me. You know, if we're going to work with God, it is important for us to understand how God thinks, how he works. 1 Corinthians 2.16, the Bible says, For who has known the mind of the Lord and, the way, and, and, the, and that he should instruct him? He goes on to say this, but we have the mind of Christ. Paul said, but we have the mind of Christ. We got to learn to think like Jesus, as the Apostle Paul says. Now, we go into the parable that Jesus spoke of. Get your Bibles, turn to Matthew 13. Let's look at that. Matthew 13. There's a lesson here that Jesus aimed to teach in terms of this parable he gave. Matthew chapter 13. Let's look at it. Notice what the Bible says here. 
chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. The Bible says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. Now the kingdom of heaven spoken of here, that is God work on this earth. We'll see that later. You know, Ellen White in her writing, she says here in uh, Our Higher Calling, she says, the church of God upon the earth is one with the church of God above. I read on, verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy, notice what he says, his enemy, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Thy field. From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather, up the, gather them up? But he said, Nay. That's why you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Verse 30. But let but but both grow together. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will send the reapers. Gather ye together first. Notice what it says. First the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Jesus speaking here, gather the wheat into my barns. Now, later in this chapter, the disciples, you know, they, 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 they wanted to ask Jesus, they asked him to explain this parable. And he does. In verse 36, they ask that, in verse 36, to Jesus to explain this story. He goes on to say in verse 37 to 43. Notice what he says in verse 37. He says to them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Who sowed the good seed, the Bible says? Jesus. Verse 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is who? The, the Bible said the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. And th as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of the kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. That's lawlessness, commandment breakers, willingly, knowingly. Verse 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing, gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as his son in the kingdom of their father. Who hath an ear, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. In other words, there's a lesson here for all of us. The important thing is to listen and pay attention. Now, notice, first of all, in the lesson that the, in this parable brings concern, brings concern concerning the physical world. Notice what Jesus said, the, Jesus said the field, the physical world. This is what Jesus aimed to teach. This physical is an application for the spiritual. 
Now, all around us is nature. All around about us is nature. We see evidence of beauty, the flowers, the vegetables, the delicious fruit. We see all of this. It's there to make us happy. God put it here to make us happy. But some of the plants, instead of having beautiful flowers, have ugly thorns. As we go through the woods, we see and enjoy what is meant for us to enjoy. We see the, be the beautiful greenery. We see this as we walk in nature. This is meant for us to enjoy. But more than once, we get scratched by these pricky little thorns, these bad weeds, these pricky little plants. I was walking this week. I was in the Botanical Gardens in Norfolk. I all right. I went into the Botanical Gardens. I love gardens. I went there, and in Norfolk, the Botanical Garden is very beautiful. They got all this greenery. I mean, it's just for, for acres and acres. I went there. I enjoy and I appreciate what God has done for us. And I want to be like Jesus. I want to see an application in nature. So when I went there, I walked around, and they have these pavements, these, and it's concrete. You can go all around there. And if you get kind of warm or hot, they have all these shade trees and benches there, and, and, and they have refreshments there. And I was walking around. I, I, I went there. I got there like after one. To tell you how much I enjoyed it, I didn't leave it after five. Well, I made my rounds, I was taking pictures, I had my video going, because I want to look back. I might want to print some of the pictures. Well, as I was walking through the Rose Garden, it was huge, I mean, it was huge. And I was walking by the Rose Garden, I didn't see this. There was a weed, yay tall. This thing had, I mean, horrific thorns on them. I didn't see it. I passed by and it snagged my shirt. And it was one of my good shirts. And so I went on, and I was saying, I'm glad I didn't get my arm. And I walked away, and I turned back around and looked at it. I said, you pricky little thorn, you. And I remember what Jesus said. And I said right then, this plant is not from God. It's from the devil. And my mind went back to this message right here. Matthew 13. You know, but I thank God it's permitted in order that we may see how futile it is for the creature to try to improve on what the creator has done. Satan. And man too. He works through man just like Jesus works through people. Instead of, seeing, instead of seeking to joy what the enemy is twisting and changing, trying to improve on what God made, as for God, his works is perfect. The Bible tells us that in Deuteronomy 32, 4. If we were all like God made us, oh, how beautiful the human race would be in body, in mind, in spirit. It is as we seek to work with God to restore the original beauty, the reflection of his image, that we are most successful. The image that God wants to restore back in us through Jesus Christ. But now, these lessons in physical, you know, they're designed to teach us, as I said before, a spiritual lesson. We look again now to the 13th chapter. Notice in, in, in the same verse now, in verse 24, look at it again. Notice it says the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said it's like the story that's happening in the field. This is what he's trying to relate to us. The kingdom of heaven is like the story of what's happening in this field. That is 
the work of the church of God on earth. His kingdom on earth. The kingdom of grace is like this. So let me ask you a question. Is Jesus at work in his church? Yes or no? Yes. Do you truly mean that? Is he sowing good seed? Yes or no? Is his seed springing up? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Is it coming into a harvest? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Now, I wish I could stop right here. But the parable goes on. Is there somebody else that is sowing seed in the church? Who is that? The enemy, the devil. Does this seed spring up? Yes or no? Yes. Question again. Where does it spring up? In the church. It is among the wheat. That's what the Bible teaches us. Was there 40 acres over here and 40 acres of tares over here and 40 acres of wheat over here? Was it like that? No, no. They was all together. The whole field had wheat and the whole, wheat, the whole field had tares. Did you ever hear somebody say, that might say, well, you know, I want to move from this place here, because you know why? There's bad influences there. And they moved over here, what do you think is this heaven or next door to heaven? You ever know anybody do something like that? Hmm. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, if they stay long enough, they're going to find out what's going in there. Tears, tears, and tears. So the question naturally arises with us, why in the world should tears be in the field? Why should there be tears in God's field? In the story that Jesus told, the enemy was sowing tears, operating in his field. You know, he was an enemy of the man that owned the land. The devil slips right in. He comes in and he plants, he, plant, he planted his seeds. And he's planting seeds all the time in the church. The devil. So far, I haven't found not one place where he's not operating. What about you? If you do, show it to me. Now the next question. We found out that the devil had sowed these tares all around in the church. The question that the servant asked the master of the field. Then, since you told us how these tares got there, the servant asked the master, an enemy sowed them. Master, is it your wish that we go and pull them up? 
They're tares. Don't you want to get rid of them? And gather them up and pull them up by the root so they won't come back. Is that what you want us to do, Master? Is that what you want to do? The master was looking farther than the servants was. Oh no. The master was looking farther than the servant was. Remember the text. Isaiah 55, 89. He told them no. Can you tell them why? Yeah. Those tares and wheat are growing so close together, they are so rooted and so intermeshed and intermingled together that if you root out the tares, you're going to root up some wheat, and we can't have that. Understanding his thoughts, his ways. He looks ahead. Jesus does. The beginning of the great controversy in heaven, before the creation of this world, Lucifer rebelled against God and his law. Oh yeah. He carried with him his rebellion and how many angels went with him? A third of the angels. And these angels had always been good. Good angels, loyal angels had always been good. One third of them joined Lucifer in his rebellion. We're told here that uh, God allows the angels to choose whose side they were on because it would not be safe for any to continue in heaven who united with Lucifer. Story of redemption, page 17. So, all the angels, God is so great. All the angels in heaven had to show who they were and what they were. God said, no, not yet. Let the character be fully developed. I want to see all choose or show, I should say, who they really are in heaven. During the early stage of the great controversy, tears were so mingled that only God knew who was who. Only God knew who was who in heaven. But there came the harvest day. Every head of wheat shone itself wheat Every weed showed itself natu nature as wheat, as weed. The separation was made as character was fully developed and distinguished. Then came the separation. That's an end time application. That's an end time event right there. What happened to those rebellious angels? Rebellious angels. One third. They were separated. They were cast out of heaven. Now, how long a period was that? We don't know. But I can tell you this. It was more than a few hours. That I can tell you. Development of character is a tremendous process, we're told. But when those characters were fully developed, not one loyal angel joined the army of the devil since that separation took place. And not one of the devil's angels have come back and joined Jesus in loyalty. Not one. The righteous is righteous still. The wicked or wicked still. That's in time. Their case, probation closed. They're, they're, it's sealed. Your life is sealed. There's one more final separation. It is coming again, this time with men and women. Are we approaching that hour? Oh, yes. The wheat are growing. The tares are growing. Which are you?
my sister and my brother. You know, there's one thing about this that makes me so thankful, and that is this. You and I, you and I can choose right now which one of these characters will be developed. Tear or wheat. We decide that. Jesus can develop the wheat character. The valuable character like him or we can decide to join the enemy in rebellion and develop the tear of the character, the, the, the tear character. That weed character, which is only fit to be burned in the lake of fire. But everybody here, including myself, everybody here is going to be one or the other, no question. Everybody's going to turn out golden grain for the garden of God or tares for the bonfire. And that is the truth. Everyone. You know, speaking of nature, without the Bible, nature will be a riddle with no answers. But because of this book right here, the Holy Bible, the scriptures pull the veil aside and we can see and know what's happening with this book right here, the Holy Bible. Here we are told that he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, but the one who sows the weeds, the bad seeds, the tares, is the devil. Listen to this statement from Inspiration, Testimonial, Volume 6, page 186. Here's what she writes. Here's what she penned. The God of nature is perpetually at work. His infinite power, his infinite power works unseen, but manifestation appear in the effect which the work produce. The same God who guides the plants works in the fruit orchard and in the vegetable garden. He never made a thorn. You see that? He never made a thorn, a thistle, or a tear. These are Satan's work and the result of degeneration. Degeneration, what is that? A process of declining. That's this world, you can look at it that way. Introduced by him among the precious things, but it is through God's immediate agency that every bud bursts into blossom. You know what Satan does? He used amalgamation. You know what that is, don't you? He used amalgamation. That's the mixing and blending of different elements. Here's another statement. Listen to this one. Manuscript 65, 1899. She writes this. All tares are sown by the evil one. Every nauseous herb is of his sowing. And by his ingenious method, she says, ingenious methods of um, amalgamation, he has corrupted the earth with tares. There's a man. There was a man. His name was called Luther Bornbark. No, Bornbank. I better pronounce it right. His name was called Luther Burbank. That's it. Luther Burbank. This man here, they call him the plant wizard. He was a plant breeder. You know, he was, he, he took a cactus. He took a cactus and he developed it so it had no thorns. Look him up. Check me out. So cattle can eat the cactus. He developed this cactus with no pointy things on it. Now let me just mention this. And he used to do it with variation of fruit and vegetables. He developed this. Not created, developed. It's a difference. You want to know who inspired him? Charles Darwin. 
It's like his mentor. This man here, his name is Luther Burbank. Now think about this. This man here, if a mere man with his scientific ability and research and experimentation, if a mere man could take thorns off a cactus, is there anything strange that Satan, with his mastermind, could put thorns on them? We're told that he has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature. This, this enemy, Satan, the devil, he wants to destroy me and you. He hates the human race. He is the one responsible for these viruses, these bacteria, germs. And multitudes suffer and die. He likes that. He works all the time with his mastermind, sowing tears among, sowing tears among the wheat to develop thorns and briars where God has created beauty. Satan is not a creator. Don't make that point. He cannot give life. He cannot create. He cannot make something out of nothing. Mm -mm, he can't do that. But he can take that which God has made and created and he can twist it. He can pervert it. He can mar it. Which he has done. And this, what has been going on for 6,000 years. He even, even with human beings, yes, you heard me, with human beings. I'm going to read something to you again. Listen to this. Let's see, can I find it? It's in here somewhere in my little notes here. Oh, I thought I had it. Oh, here it is. Listen to this. This is Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 64, paragraph 1, and also Spiritual Gift, Volume 3, page 75, paragraph 3. Listen to this. But if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast, which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. God purposed to destroy by a flood that powerful long-lived race that had corrupted their ways before him. He would not suffer them to live out their days of their natural life, which would be hundreds of years. I read on. Every species of animals which God had created were pre preserved in the ark. The confused species which God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation, were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost endless variety of species and animals and in certain races of men. After Noah had come forth from the ark, he looked around upon the powerful and ferocious beast which he had brought out of the ark. And then upon his family, numbering eight, he was greatly afraid that they would be destroyed by these beasts. But the Lord sent his angels to say to Noah, the fear of you, the dread of you, shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, and upon all that move upon the earth and all of the fishes in the sea. And to your hands they are delivered. I just want to share that with you. Now, reading on. If, speaking about this enemy of ours, this is what it has been done in animals and birds and all that. You know, this is why we see all these, all these planets so, so much evidence of sin because of what Satan has done. 
the degeneration, disease, death. Look at the whole big picture of desolation. Just look at that for a minute. We can say in the words of Jesus, an enemy has done this. God allowed the devil to do this for a purpose, to exhibit his character. That's why God allowed it. You see, Lucifer, he had proclaimed that he had a better way than God. Lucifer did. So far, to me, I don't think he have a great showing. What about you? Are you pleased with what he have done? I'm not. And yet, he's still leading millions astray, this foe. What a strange distortion of what he have done with what God created. Now, I just want to touch on a few other things before I close here, but I got a little more time. Now, in this parable, I want to touch on this. This may have troubled you in times, or will trouble you in the future. Everybody here has either been troubled by it or will be. Now, listen to this. If this is God's church, why, if this is God's church, why are there so many hypocrites? Or were you ever troubled about that? Were you ever troubled about that? Maybe not. I was. When people say, well, how is it then if this is the truth and if the gospel is correct and the gospel has power, how is it then that there are so many people in the church that don't live up to it? Listen to this. Testimonies, page 47, paragraph 1. Here's what some people think. Some people seem to think that upon entering the church, they will have their expectations fulfilled. They meet only with those who are, and they meet only with those who are pure and perfect. This is what they think when they come to church. They are zealous in their faith, and they are. And when they see false in church members, they say, we left the world in order to have no association with evil characters, but the devil is here also. And they ask, as did the servant in the parable, from whence have it tears? I left the world in order to get away from this bad influence of sin, and I come in the church, and here it is. And I think I wonder, they say, I think I wonder if I'm in the right place. Did you ever hear of a man named Judas? What church he belonged to? <laughs> Jesus Church. Now, the next question is, did he belong to the true church? Yes. Was he an officer in the church? Yes. How do you know he was an officer in the church? How do you know that? Because it was Christ's church. That's how we know he's in the true church. It was Christ's church. He was right there and organized it. Jesus did. Judas was an officer. Was he anything else? Yes. Judas was an evangelist. Judas preached. He healed the sick. Just go to Mark 3, start at verse 13, go to 19, you'll see it. He was a minister, ordained. Who ordained him? Jesus did. 
You say, oh, I don't want to be a church like that. I don't want to be in a church where Judas is there. I don't want to be there. If Jew, Judas is there. I don't want to be there if Judas is there. Oh, I pray. I pray that we don't have the character of Judas. God save us from this fate. But I want to tell you something. If we've been in the church with Jesus, Judas would be right next to us. In the first communion service, who feet did Jesus wash first? Judas. He sat right next to Jesus at the communion table. And there are people who will say, well, just leave me out then if Jews going to be there. I don't want to take part in communion. I don't want to take part in communion. If Jews going to be there, leave me out of communion. Some would say that. Well, some would say, well, that was before Pentecost. And Judas was sifted out before Pentecost. That's true. You're right. He was. Yeah, he was sifted out before Pentecost. Yes, that's true. But now, let's come on down to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5. There we have that Ananias and Safari. What happened to them? They died. Why? They lied. They lied. They lied about what they had promised God. And they paid the price, the ultimate price, death. This is after Pentecost now. After Pentecost. God took care of them at the right time. But it wasn't only the hypocrites like Ananias and, and Safari that we read about in the book of Acts. It wasn't just them. Remember then in the book of Acts chapter 6, there arose some murmuring among the Greeks against the Hebrews concerning their widows. They were neglected. They start murmuring. Someone said, oh, I don't want to be in no church where there's murmuring. Oh, I don't want to be there. Well, this was God's only church at the time. And there was murmuring, murmuring in it. You go on down to Acts 5. You find, you find Paul and Barnabas. Oh, yeah. Paul and Barnabas. Now, these two brothers, oh, I love them. You know, they're having a wonderful time in an evangelistic trip. They're having a wonderful time. They go, they're going from place to place, raising up church and almost everywhere they go. Paul and Barnabas. They come back to Antioch and tell their story. They find a side to go out again. And Barnabas wanted to take who? John Mark. That was his cousin. What did Paul say? Paul said, no, we're not taking him. No, 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 not him. Why, Paul? Well, you know, he left us and ran back home to his mother when things got hard. We're not taking him, Paul said. Go to show you. Even great men, even mighty men of God, sometimes they blunder. But God don't give up on them. He don't think like we think. He don't do things like we do them. Barbara said, what? Oh, yes, we is. We're taking him. We're taking him. Paul said, no, no, we're not. Barnabas said, yes, we are. And you read it there in Acts 15, the Bible says the contention was so sharp between them that they departed and went their separate ways. Now, notice this now. They weren't thieves like Judas. They were not thieves. They were not hypocrites like Ananias and Sapphira. They weren't like that. But they exhibit some human nature like you and I. John Mark became a wonderful evangelist, a soul winner for Christ because Barnabas did, did, did not give up on him. And there's Peter. He comes to Antioch. Now, God already revealed to Peter that he is no respecter person. But you see, 
He would eat with the Gentiles when the other brethren wasn't around. Those, you know, at, at those who was uh, at the headquarters. The other, his other brother, like James and so forth. But when they come around, he would back away from them. Like, I don't want nothing to do with you. But what did Paul say about that? He rebuked them. But what I like about Peter is, Peter took it. I like what he did. He took the rebuke. Not like many of us. He took the rebuke. Peter did. Don't misunderstand. We must not deliberately choose the worst atmosphere for our children. But let me, before I get there, let me just say this. While those things in the Bible to help us to learn the lesson that Jesus wanted to teach us in his parables of terrors, the good, the bad, victory, defeat, success, failure, mixed with mingling together with church members on earth. He wanted to teach us a lesson in this. That's why he is there. You know, there's uh, something else. All our zeal will not be successful in making the church militant members as pure as the church triumph victorious. So we're looking to find a place in, a, in this planet where everybody going to be have the right influence. It won't happen. It will not happen. Mm -mm. Your children, I want them to be around children with great influence, which will influence them correctly. Well, I don't, I don't know where to point you. There's bad influence everywhere. Don't, now, this is what I want to say. Don't misunderstand me by this. It, what I'm saying is, don't, you know, we shouldn't purposely, deliberately try to choose the worst environment for our children or ourselves. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We want to, we want to do all we can to get all the help we can, but do our part in it. And after we have done all that we can, God's still going to allow us to be surrounded by wheat and tears. After we have done all that we can, God's still going to allow us. Question comes, you know, Jesus said, the enemy did this bad thing. The tares and the wheat. Get them out of my hair, somebody says. Jesus says, no. That's why you pull up the tares, you pull up the wheat. Oh, if God had not waited as long as he did in heaven for the separation. If he had not waited, those good angels would probably have been lost too. They probably lost their way. But he waited. He waited them out. He waited with infinite patience. He's doing the same thing today. I got to move on quick. You know, as we tell this story, you know, I, uh, a person... What a, what a shame, you know, sometimes we, we allow cause, we, we, we stumble we, because what somebody else done, we stumble because, so, so, we stumble because someone else has done something and we're watching them and we stumble because they stumble. That shouldn't be. That shouldn't be. Remember what the Bible says concerning Judas, Ananias, even Paul and Barnabas, even Peter, Terrible failures was made. But God worked with them. And he brought them through. Think of Abraham and Isaac. They lied. You know, they said, told, they told the, uh, the, the, uh, the king, Abimelech, you know, that their wife was a sister. They both said the same thing. How amazing. They both said the same thing. Jacob had a blunder or two. Talked about Jacob in our, in our Sabbath lesson. And yet God kept on and finally won the victory, and they won the victory through determination and, and God being patient with them. Every sinner can find Jesus Christ in repentance and salvation. I don't care what you've done. But if you and I are going to stumble on what someone else has done, then that shouldn't, that shouldn't be. We shouldn't stumble on what another person done. Remember, Lucifer started this thing. You know, he had nothing to stumble over. Sin would try to make an excuse. You know that? <laughs> Sin would try to make an excuse, an explanation. Even Lucifer covered all his mysteries, all his doing. He made it appear that he was improving God's government. An enemy of God. Why stumble over someone else? Why? 
You know, um, nobody else can save us but Jesus. Nobody can cause you or me to lose our soul but you or me. Nobody else. The church is the school in which God teaches lesson. And just because a student in the class missed something the teacher put on the board, it don't mean, that doesn't mean that you should leave school. If a teacher's writing something on the board and half the class missed what she put on the board, that don't mean you should leave school. Because the others failed to get that. Oh, no other reason for the teacher to write a mathematical problem on the board and all the students in the class get a flat zero. There's still no reason for you to flunk out. Jesus have a church. He's running a school. He is getting people ready for graduation from this life to eternal life. Christ is doing this right now. He gives us his perfect pattern. Sometimes, you know, a teacher, she would write something on the blackboard and say, children, now I want you to copy this. <laughs> the teacher, right? It's happened to me a couple of times. I have seen it, I mean. And you know, the, the, it's not what you do. I want you to do a good job copying everything I wrote exactly as I wrote it. I want you to copy this. Now, let's say you're a boy and you're in this class sitting right next to you. You know, you, 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 now, would this help you? Would this help you? If you saw, if you saw the person next to you writing something down and, and you copy after them, would that help you? No. You had better look at the copy. And where we have failed, looking to others, where we have stumbled by watching others, let us turn our eyes on Jesus and thank him for one perfect copy and for the assurance that he will fully, fully develop all who will let him develop their character in them and through them and through him. So that is the message today. And we're going to close. I'm going to close now. And my, that's my appeal. Please, don't be deterred by things that happen in the church. People leave the church for some of the reasons. Well, wait, where are you going? This is God's church. Tears are in it. You may be a blessing to someone else by being faithful to God. Don't follow people. I don't care if it's the pastor, the elders, me, anyone in leadership position. Don't follow no man. Follow the perfect pattern, Jesus Christ. You know you are safe then. You can't fail. You won't lose. You get discouraged so quickly. I have done it. But God helped me to grow a little. A little here, a little there. People say, oh, I don't like this. I'm leaving. Oh, you know, too many people Oh, hypocrites, I don't want to be around them. I'm going over here. I'm going to listen over here. You should read this story right here in Matthew 13 about the tares and the wheat and understand what Jesus is saying. If Jesus had a tear among him while he lived, what do you think is going to happen now? There's tears everywhere. But thank God, you and me, we can decide to be tear or wheat. I will close with that. That's my appeal. Come to Jesus. Be wheat. It ain't too late. Probation is not closed. Examine your heart. Don't be stubborn. Don't be proud. Don't hate. Don't backbite. Don't murmur. Just live the best life you can live. Live the best life in Jesus Christ, and you'll find out you receive a great blessing.